For the search for life in the cosmos at large, we turn to astrobiology. Given the enormous possibilities out there, it surely seems the sky's the limit. But by its very nature, astrobiology still stops short of where it actually begins to become really interesting. Its main focus remains on the conditions needed for life to be able to thrive and, more importantly even, the conditions needed for life to come into being to begin with. When it comes to any concrete evolutionary developments that would take off from that point, it becomes eerily silent. Centuries of research, however, have given us an ever more profound understanding of the natural history of our own planets. So what can we learn about some of the ground rules for evolution that we could hope to apply elsewhere in the universe? Let's find out! How life would develop when it has finally gained a foothold seems an elusive topic. That is because evolution is essentially a historic process pushed and tugged by serendipity. Random events in the ever-changing environment plus random genetic mutations meddle with the predictability of what one naively may regard as a predetermined process. Looking back at our own evolution, it's easy to fall prey to the idea of a linear progression where each step supposedly was inevitable. The fact that it emphatically is not inevitable is proven by the millions of lineages that chose a different route and ended up at different outcomes. If the development of humanoid sapiens was an inevitable outcome of evolution, then there would be a multitude of similar examples on our planet alone. The fact that there's only a single example of humanoids out of millions of lineages underlines how much of a fluke we are, or any other singular life form for that matter. But that doesn't mean there isn't some level of predictability. One of the most important and often cited principles for predicting evolutionary outcomes is convergence or convergent evolution. So what is it precisely? When European explorers discovered new overseas lands, these were like alien planets to them especially lands like Australia. What makes Australia stand out is, of course, its very different fauna. As we all know, the Australian continent houses a wholly different kind of mammal. Marsupials are a separate branch of mammalia, distinct from the placental mammals we're mostly familiar with, with the main difference being the mode of reproduction. It's mind-boggling to realize that an elephant shrew is more closely related to a blue whale than it is to the much more similar Australian dunnards. And the reason is of course related to the environment and mode of life. The common ancestor of marsupials and placental mammals was a small insectivorous creature that lived 160 million years ago. As small insectivores themselves, elephant shrews and dunnards remained relatively close to this ancestral state, while some of their brethren became very different indeed. Millions of years of mammalian evolution gave us elephants, kangaroos and humans. But there were also some lineages that started to look very similar to each other. The thylacine, for example, looks very much like a placental wolf or other wild canid, represented here by an Australian dingo. And this is a prime example of convergent evolution. The explanation is that a creature's way of life or ecological niche pushes development towards similar solutions to the same overall challenges. The ancestors of both the thylacine and the placental wolf started hunting larger prey that were evolving to become ever faster in their attempts to escape their clutches. For the dog family, those were deer, and for marsupial predators, those were kangaroos. Convergence means moving towards the same place, just as, for example, rivers could be flowing to the same lake. Convergent evolution is a very fundamental principle when talking about the evolution of life on this or any other planets. You hear it all the time as a justification for why fictional aliens look strikingly like humans or other animals that we know from Earth. The idea seems to be that if you can have very similar faunas on isolated continents like Australia, then you'd expect very similar faunas on entirely different worlds as well. So. Would other worlds have their own brand of wolves, deer and humans? Would there be any other canoids, servoids and humanoids out there? 
For many science fiction universes, this certainly seems to be assumed as much. However, there is at least one important issue here that many overlook. The primary issue with convergent evolution is a thing called parallel evolution. Wolves and thylacines are very similar, but they also had a very similar starting point. And this similar starting point is that small insectivorous creature that was the ancestral state for all deeper mammalian lineages. This is why some experts like to distinguish between convergence and parallel evolution. So what is the distinction? Convergence is arriving at the same overall solution from different starting points. Parallelism is arriving at the same overall solution from the same starting points. Convergence means getting to the same place using different roads. Parallelism means following basically the same road. But it's actually not quite that easy to distinguish these two in practice. That is because all life is related to varying degrees, meaning that for every two life forms there is a common starting point if you go back in time far enough. So it's a bit of a grey zone and depends on what details you choose to focus on. Let's take flight for example. There are several different kinds of animals, like birds, bats and insects, that have evolved wings for flying, and each in their own very distinct ways. To some degree, the wings of birds and bats are convergently evolved. In birds, the wing surface area is formed by feathers, and in bats, it's formed by skin. However, the supporting structure is still formed by the same forelimb and this element of the different kinds of wing is therefore homologous. In that sense, it's a parallel development, because they have a similar starting point. Their common ancestor was a lizard-like creature living 340 million years ago, and it already had the four limbs that both birds and bats later modified in parallel ways. However, the common ancestor with insects was a flatworm-like creature without limbs. The wings of the insects are formed by completely different structures. So these wings are highly convergent with those of a bird or a bat. But on a deeper level, they're also parallel to some degree, because related genes laid down a lot of the basic framework, meaning there's still some fundamental similarity. The layout of the body, including polarity, symmetry and regionalization, is controlled by a lot of the same, or in any case related, regulatory genes. So the degree of parallelism or convergence is strongly affected by the depth of common ancestry. This also puts constraints on how similar two lineages would tend to become at all. We already saw how wolves and thylacines derive their very similar bodies from the basic mammalian body plan that they adapted to being fast land hunters of larger prey. As the common ancestors with birds was a lizard-like tetrapod, an alternative pathway to the same niche of a fast land hunter of larger prey already looks quite different. That would be a medium-sized raptorial dinosaur, or, from more recent times, the so-called terror birds or forest rackets that used to be South America's apex predators. All these cases are based on the general tetrapod body plan of a backboned frame carried by two pairs of legs, with a head at the end of a neck and a long tail. So a parallel modification of these elements would naturally lead to longer legs placed underneath the body and the neck ending in a skull with elongated jaws. But for a lot of the other details, alternative solutions were arrived at. For instance, while mammals developed fur, dinosaurs opted for feathers. And while proto-dinosaurs went for bipedalism, mammals stayed on all fours. And so on. When looking at this, it becomes clear that any convergence is modulated by the fact that there often is quite a range of alternative options to choose from. So the more distantly related two different life forms are, the greater the likelihood of dissimilar solutions to similar problems. Common origins only restrict shared ancestral innovations, but not those acquired later and independently. 
And there we have the huge problem of evolution of life forms on other planets. There is no shared ancestry, so there's no common starting point whatsoever. Since we are already getting wildly different results, even with lineages that are ultimately related, imagine how different the completely unrelated alien lineages would be. So when thinking about highly evolved alien life forms, instead of focusing on convergence, it's key to focus on divergence. Looking at the different solutions that nature came up with to the same challenges, rather than those that are the same, may give a much better idea of what's out there. So instead of looking at other mammals, look at birds, squid, crustaceans and so on. Evolution is a historical process following its own trajectories, strongly affected by geological and even cosmic events, driving conditions on the host planet. Evolving creatures will respond in various ways to these changing conditions. And any minor evolutionary choices will translate into major differences in the long run. So therefore it seems unlikely that many of the life forms that came into existence on Earth will have very similar carbon copies on other worlds. So does that mean life in alien biospheres would have nothing in common? Well, there's at least one thing that Earth creatures share with extraterrestrial life forms, and that is the physics that is probably the same across the entire cosmos. In the next video of this series, I will explore some of the basic body forms that we will be guaranteed to find on other planets, as well as some universal patterns. Make sure you don't miss that one, so please subscribe and hit the bell icon. For now, thanks for watching, cheers and bye bye!